Hi folks, this is International Master Kostya Kavutsky, and today I'll be doing a lesson on the topic of pawn chains. So pawn chains are usually a collection of two or more pawns that are connected and blocked by an enemy pawn chain. Here we have a classic position from the French defense where the black pawns e6, d5 constitute one pawn chain, kf7 pawn can also be included in this chain, and white's pawns on d4, e5 are kind of an opposing pawn chain. So in this video today, I wanted to share some of the common ideas that you should be looking for when playing positions with pawn chains. These are very common in the French defense, and they pop up in all kinds of openings. Uh, Karo Khan defense, Almost any opening can reach some kind of structure with uh, blocked pawn chains like this. So the first idea I wanted to talk about in regards to pawn chains is what is known as attacking the point. Now the point of a pawn chain is basically the most advanced pawn, in this case the pawn on e5. And one of the key strategies of fighting against a pawn chain is to attack the point with a pawn break, in this case Black plays f6. Now, if anyone is playing the French defense in the repertoire, this f6 idea is one of the most common plans in the French. Uh, and the idea is to challenge white's space advantage, challenge this e5 pawn, and open up some lines for black's pieces. In particular, the rook on f8 is now going to be opened up on the f file, and a lot of times this bishop. The dark squared bishop can even come back to f6 and use the diagonal in order to put pressure on white's pawn on d4. So this idea of the pawn break in order to attack the point of the pawn chain is very, very common. Whenever your opponent has an advanced pawn, it almost always makes sense to at least consider attacking it with a break like f6. The drawbacks to playing this move is that I believe are twofold. Number one, you are moving a pawn in front of your king. In this case, the king on g8 is not exactly vulnerable, but it's definitely less secure as soon as you move the f pawn. Secondly, once white captures on f6 and black takes back, the e6 pawn has become a backwards pawn. So this is uh, definitely a potential weakness in the position. So these are some dynamic factors that you have to evaluate on a case by case basis. On one hand, black gets more activity and more space for the pieces. On the other hand, the e6 pawn is now weak and the king is potentially more exposed. Now, white is not forced to capture on f6, but if they do not, then black is threatening to capture the pawn on e5 as it is hanging, with queen takes e5 coming up. So this actually took place in, in one of my games from a few years back and just wanted to show how the game continued to quickly illustrate some of the benefits of this move. In this case, I believe the f6 move was definitely justified and probably the best plan of the position. Now, if white supported the pawn with a move like f4, this is definitely a double-edged decision. On one hand, white keeps the space advantage secure. On the other hand, he's pushing another pawn in front of his king and is potentially weakening the king. In this case, white has already pushed the g pawn earlier, now he's pushing the f pawn, so if the position ever opens up, this king on g1 might find itself in a lot of trouble. In this case, I think black's best play is to take on e5. White takes most likely with the f pawn. Now move queen e7. And black's idea here will be to play the move bishop to g5 and try to trade off the dark squared bishop. Once black is able to do this, the d4 pawn will be weak and black's queen might be able to come in and challenge white on the dark squares. If black is able to achieve this, I think black will have uh, quite a decent initiative here. So in the game after f6, white indeed took on f6. And now black has a choice. I think taking with the bishop definitely makes sense in order to put pressure on the d4 pawn. But in the game, I decided to take the rook as I felt that I can get a lot of counterplay on the f-file. Queen b2 was played, attacking the pawn on b7, rook f7, bishop b5, and rook cf8. So now that the f-file has opened, it makes sense for black to switch over to the f-file. So I ended up winning this game. If you're curious, you can check out the full PGN after the lesson. But here it's clear that black has achieved uh, quite a serious strategic goal in opening the f-file and getting rid of white's big space gaining pawn on e5. So with that, let's move on to our next example. Our next example here comes from kind of a similar pawn structure, 
Of course, this didn't come from a French defense, but it almost looks like a reverse French with white having the e3, d4, c5 pawn chain and black having this long pawn chain themselves. Now, when the position is fully blocked, then there's a couple of, I think, key concepts or ideas to understand. Number one, a blocked position usually means that you're more able to attack on the wing or the sides of the board. This is because the center is blocked, so the position is not as dynamic and the pieces aren't as open to potential tactics. This means that you have more time to attack on the wing. Compare this to a position where the central pawns have been traded. It can be very risky to attack on the wing because the center is going to be open and that shows a lot of potential for tactics in the position and pushing pawns on the side of the board is just going to weaken your position a lot of times. But here it is the most natural plan. Now in figuring out what your plan is in the position, a very useful tool that most players learn when they're very young is to just look at the direction of the pawns and where they're pointing. In this case, it's pretty clear. White's pawn chain is pointing at the queen side. You know, we can draw an arrow from f2 to c5. This means that white should most likely play on the queen side and look to advance and break through there. For black, it is typically going to be the exact opposite. Here, the pawns are aiming at the king side, so it makes sense for black to start initiating play on the king side. And it, of course, it makes sense because black has more squares on the king side. Definitely seems like black has more space on that side of the board. So when you're playing this locked position with pawn chains, you need to pay a lot of attention to where you're going to be stronger. Here, white is clearly stronger on the queen side. So it seems like white is a bit more developed here. I think white definitely has an advantage in this position. And here white advances with the move b5. So white is basically gaining space on the queen side. He's trying to create a target for his pieces to attack. And we'll see exactly how he does this in this game. I think it's very instructive the way white continues his pressure on the queen side. Black played queen e6. And I should note that black is much further away from initiating serious action. For black, the most likely plan here would be to push the f pawn to f5 and then f4. This would be kind of the mirror plan for black in this position in order to start attacking on the king side. But as we can see, black is well behind in this position. And now white plays a5. Really, really strong move. So the plan that white is demonstrating here is known as attacking the base of the pawn chain. Here in black's pawn chain, we have the b7 pawn as the so-called base. And when you attack b7, because this pawn has no pawns backing it up, right, there are no pawns on a8 or c8, if this pawn is taken or traded off, the rest of the pawn chain becomes weaker. So this is, I guess, I would say the second most common plan of uh, pawn chain ideas or pawn chain play is to attack the base, the first being attacking the point. In this position, it's clear if we go back a move that attacking the point of the pawn chain with the move like f3 would be very bad for white. In fact, this loses a pawn right away as after black takes on f3, the e3 pawn is immediately hanging with check. And here, something has gone terribly wrong for white. So when you're playing with pawn chains, again, it's kind of a, a matter of judgment to figure out whether you should be attacking the point or attacking the base. Here, white's pieces are clearly orchestrated to open up the queen side. Now, after a5, white's idea is to play a6 and to fully collapse black's pawn structure. If white is able to do this, he should be able to win the game. So here, black played g5. He is advancing on the king side. Black had a couple options here. Taking on b5 here would be pretty bad because white can take with the knight and now the knight is threatening the a7 pawn and is threatening to come in with knight to d6. Here I should mention that b7 pawn ends up being a weakness on an open file and the d5 pawn now has no pawn supporting it and is a potential weakness in the position as well. If black tries to play a6, this is a common idea in order to prevent white from pushing a6 himself, but here white can capture twice on a6 with bishop takes a6, and after rook a8 in order to try and win back the pawn, white can get a serious advantage here with the move bishop b7. For example, rook takes a5, bishop b4, and after the exchange of rooks, 
It is clear that white has made huge progress on the queen side. He's opened some files. The c6 pawn is now chronic weakness, and white is ready to start putting maximum pressure on this pawn with rook a6. So here I think white is just doing great, and we can see white's strategy kind of winning out in full form. Black's pieces are very passive, considering that now the fight is taking place on the queen side. So instead, black looked for active counterplay with this move g5. Now black is trying to play g4 very quickly and try to get some kind of kingside play going. But as we'll see, white's attack here ends up being faster. a6. So finally, white has initiated contact with the base of the pawn chain and black's position on the queen side is collapsing. b takes a6 was played. And of course, we take the pawn on c6. These doubled A pawns aren't going anywhere, white will be able to win them in a matter of time, but taking the C6 pawn is much more important, as now the D5 pawn becomes weak. As you can see, once you start attacking the base of the pawn, it becomes very, very easy to simply collapse and destroy your opponent's pawn structure. Black played rook takes C6, and after rook to B1, it is clear that white has a big advantage. Now he's ready to infiltrate along the B file, this pawn on d5 is a potential weakness. We're going to be able to win the a6 pawn soon enough. And it's clear that white's strategy here has really paid off. If you're curious to see how white was able to convert his advantage, I would strongly encourage you guys to take a look at the PGN file. But for now, we'll move on to our next example. Here, I wanted to show you guys one more example in the French defense. This comes from the advanced French variation where White advances very early with the move e5. And in this position, Black's main idea is to put maximum pressure on d4. Now, the d4 pawn is not really the base of the pawn chain. That would be the pawn on b2. And it's not the point either. It's kind of just in the middle. But Black's idea is that by using the c5 pawn to put pressure on d4, when Black does capture on d4, White will be forced to take with the c3 pawn, and thus black will create a weakness on d4. So this is another way of, very, very common way, I should say, of playing against the pawn chain. Here, after white plays bishop d3, black takes on d4. Note that this pawn isn't yet hanging due to a common opening trap, simply because after the trade of knights, white has bishop b5 check and wins the queen on d4. This is well known, so don't fall for this if you're playing the French. Instead, black plays the move bishop to d7, blocking the check, and now this pawn is under attack. In this game, white played bishop e2 in order to defend the pawn, and now black develops his pieces very purposefully with the move knight to e7. Here, the knight is coming to f5, and black will be putting maximum pressure on d4. For example, b3 was played, knight f5, bishop b2. Now, white is able to defend the d4 pawn, but it's clear that black has very nice and active position with three of his pieces attacking the d4 pawn. And after the move bishop b4 check, it's actually pretty clear that something has gone wrong for white as he has no way of dealing with this check in some kind of nice fashion. The point is that any move that blocks the check will also prevent white from being able to defend the d4 pawn. So here black has enough pieces to simply capture on d4. In the game, white was forced to play king f1, which isn't an end of the world. White can still play g3 and put the king on g2, but it's clear that black has already seized the initiative from the opening and should be very happy with his position. So this was one of the key ways to keep in mind of attacking the pawn chain is if you're not able to attack the base of the pawn chain, you can always try and create a new base with a timely pawn break. In this case, the c5 pawn being the key attacker in black's position. Our last example here comes from the King's Indian defense. And this is one of the openings that leads to really, really massive pawn chains and shows one of the very, very typical positions where understanding pawn chain play is very important. Here I wanted to show a very nice game by the world champion Kasparov. Back in 1989, playing against uh, strong grandmaster Jerome Paquette. So after e5, castles knight c6, here white played d5, knight e7. And this is known as the classical main line of the King's Indian. It's one of the most popular and also one of the sharpest openings in all of chess. Now here the pawn chains 
are pretty well defined. Black's pawns are c7, d6, e5, and these are aiming at the king's side. And Black's most common plan here is to remove the knight from f6 and use the f pawn to push the f5, push the f4, and eventually even push the g pawn in order to initiate a massive pawn storm on the king's side. Meanwhile, White's plan, after the move knight e1, is to put the knight on d3 eventually and then illustrate this break c4 c5. White can also use the b4 pawn to support this and white is hoping to play on the queen side, try to open up the queen side and penetrate with his pieces there. So knight d7 is one of the main theoretical tries, bishop e3, f5, white plays f3 in order to support his pawns, f4, bishop f2, and now g5. And now you can see one of the largest pawn chains you know that you'll find in almost any opening here black is very much in position to just start a very powerful attack on the king side with knight f6 knight g6 h5 and eventually pushing g4 but of course white has his own play with b4 trying to play c5 and eventually use his rook on the c file in order to capture the pawn on d6 and try to invade with maybe knight b5 and knight coming in to c7. This opening is very very sharp, of course there are lots of variations, I just wanted to give you guys a general overview or an introduction to some of the key ideas in this position. Knight f6 was played, c5, knight g6, here white captured on d6, played rook c1, and here black plays rook f7. This is a very common idea in the King's Indian. The point is to not only defend the c7 square, but after black's next move, bishop f8, we can see this actually a nice regrouping of the pieces. Black wants to put the rook on g7, which will support the g4 break in the near future. Meanwhile, the bishop, although passive, is doing a great job defending black's main weakness in the position, which is the d6 pawn. Now white played a5, bishop d7, knight b5, and now black is ready to play his main break in the position g4. The point is, is that although white can capture this pawn, he has the bishop and queen backing it up, once the f3 pawn takes on g4, black is able to capture the e4 pawn in the center, which is quite a huge achievement for black. Not only did he take a center pawn, but now his knight is active and he's starting to capture white's very important bishop on f2. In the game, white played knight to c7, so white is also achieving his main idea to get the knight to c7. Now not only is white attacking the rook, but white is also threatening to drop the knight on e6, where it will be quite a strong piece. And here comes a very nice and thematic idea, g3. This is one of black's main attacking ideas in the position. By getting the pawn to g3, black is going to be able to launch a very devastating attack against white's king. Now if white captures the pawn on g3, and takes with the bishop, black will get huge compensation here with the move knight to h5. The bishop has to retreat either to h2 or f2, and here after the move bishop h6, it's clear that black is going to get a huge initiative. Now this bishop has been opened up on the dark squares where it is a very strong piece, the queen is ready to come to g5, the knight is ready to come to h4 or f4, and white's king and the g2 pawn are going to be huge targets for black's pieces. If you're curious, I've included some lines here in the PGN file, so you can check those out for yourselves. But black is getting a huge attack here. After the move g3, well, white decided to capture the rook on a8, and here comes the next phase of Kasparov's idea. He doesn't take the bishop on f2, instead he plays the move knight to h5. And this illustrates some of the potential power of the long pawn chain. After this move knight h5, black is starting to play queen h4 with a mating attack against white's king. And because the pawns in the center of the board are blocked up, this makes it very difficult for white's pieces to communicate to the king side, meaning white's pieces are almost helpless to defend against this attack. If white plays a move like bishop takes a7, for example, uh, saving the bishop, Black will win immediately with queen h4, white must play h3, and here comes bishop takes h3. This is a very famous, well-known bishop sacrifice in the king's Indian, and the point is that once black is able to open up white's king, white's pieces are not able to defend against the checkmate, and white is simply getting mated here. 
So in the game, white played king h1, black captured the bishop, rook takes f2, and another very thematic idea, knight to g3 check. The point is, is that if white takes this knight on g3, black will recapture with the pawn, and once again, the queen is ready to come to h4 and deliver a checkmate. The game continued for a few more moves after knight g3, king g1, black took the knight on a8, and... With two pieces for the rook, black had a fantastic attack here. If you're curious to see how this game ended, I'd welcome you guys to check out the PGN after this lesson. I hope this game demonstrates the power of the pawn chains and how you can use them to launch a very serious attack on the king side. Until next time, this was International Master Kosti Kavutsky signing off.